So, um, hey everyone, I'm Shashanka. I'm here to talk about data contracts and data quality and Airflow. Um, prior to this, I was at LinkedIn where I started the Data Hub project. I was actually responsible for the data platform team. I don't know how many of you are data platform, central data platform uh, people. You know, we have a tough life because uh, we end up being chronically understaffed and uh, overpromised to our stakeholders. So if you are a central data platform team uh, member, my commiserations, we'll hang out later and talk about all the problems that we face. Uh, but my job was dual. It was how do I make data accessible and easily usable at LinkedIn? You know, data democracy was kind of our rallying cry. So we had um, a large number of data analysts, data scientists, machine learning engineers who were hungry for data. And every day, you know, a new feature was getting built out, a new model was getting trained. And uh, we were hiring a lot of people. And so there was a lot of productivity challenges, a lot of uh, uh, reproducibility challenges that they were facing in making sure that they were producing data that was high quality, but also that they were doing it in the right way and not reusing old code that someone else had written and had, or a data set that someone had left the company 10 years ago and we were still using it. You know, all of those stories that we write about are actually true, they actually happen. So that was one side of it, making data easy to use. And the other side of it, and that's actually quite interesting because we were just hearing about privacy, was making data hard to use because um, I was actually uh, unfortunate or fortunate enough to be tasked with uh, solving GDPR for LinkedIn. And that took away most of my hair, whatever was left, and, um, and a lot of my time. And as part of that, I had to figure out where does all our data live? I thought I knew it all, but then I found out about all of the dark data that I didn't even know existed. Um, and so there was a lot of um, inventorying, but then also propagation, and a lot of also annotation challenges that we had to deal with. So I had a lot of uh, time to work on kind of the privacy tech side as well. And Data Hub kind of emerged from seeing both of those problems emerge organically. The first being understanding data, understanding where data lives and how it's getting transformed and making it easy to use and discover. And the other side being using that same information to make sure that data is used in the right way and not uh, mis misused. So that's me um, and that's a QR code. I'm getting a little more new fashion these days. So that's my LinkedIn profile. If you scan it, you can connect with me. But otherwise, uh, you can find me. I have a unique GUID in some senses in terms of my name, so it's hard to not find me. All right, so I talked about Data Hub really briefly. What is Data Hub? It's a project that uh, we started at LinkedIn. It's an open source metadata platform that enables data discovery, data observability, and federated governance. These are big words, obviously, and they mean a lot of things, and I'll go through a few examples of that today. But the main um, thing it uses is a high fidelity metadata graph that's event oriented. So every single change that's happening in your data ecosystem can get emitted, can get logged. And then Data Hub essentially has that graph uh, for you to query and make interesting uses of. Acryl, the company I founded, is advancing the Data Hub project. We contribute and are the lead maintainers on the open source project. And commercially, you know, very similar to Astronomer, we have a Acryl Cloud product that takes Data Hub and adds uh, an additional capabilities, some of which we'll see today, and I'll try to make sure to call those out as separate from uh, open source Data Hub as we go through the, the talk. So that's Data Hub. And um, in terms of Data Hub itself, uh, you know, we started Acryl in 2021. At that time, it was an interesting project. Um, some people were using it. But over the last uh, two and a half years, I would say it has really grown in popularity and adoption. Uh, it's by a lot of standards, the number one open source metadata platform now. A lot of the strength is built on uh, its strength of integrations. We have integrations with 50 plus uh, systems in the modern and postmodern and pre-modern data stack. And there's a lot of big companies using it, you know, from you know, Pinterest to Udemy, Optum, Stripe. Um, there's a few others that our Etsy uses it. So there's like 1,000 plus companies actually using it in production from what we can tell. And you know, the community is also a kind of special. It's a, you know, metadata is a messy problem and it needs a kind of a community to really talk about problems like how do we get metadata right. There was a lot of conversation about making sure that producers are being brought into the fold. And you can't just do that using technology. There's a lot of uh, culture change that is needed. And so there's a lot of conversations that happen in our Slack community. We have about 9,000 members. You know, uh, a lot of uh, 
people energy behind the project, but there's also uh, code contributions that are coming in that are fast and frequent, um, and quite a, quite a bit of adoption of the project itself. So it's doing quite well as an open source project, and I'm really fortunate uh, that I've had the, you know, the, the good fortune of being part of its journey for so long. But we are here to talk about data contracts, and it starts with metadata, right? The metadata graph, as I talked about previously, um, most of you probably are, maybe let's do a quick uh, poll before we get started. How many of you, um, this is gonna be easy, how many of you know about Airflow? All right, good, that was easy. That's the denominator. Um, now, out of this crowd, how many of you know about Data Hub or knew about Data Hub before coming to this talk? Okay, that's a pretty large number, good. Um, and then the third question, how many of you know about data contracts? Okay, so I would say my prediction was right. There's a little bit of a funnel here between knowing about Airflow and then knowing about Data Hub and then uh, knowing about data contracts. So I'll, I'll try to keep the introductory material around data contracts a little longer, just so we can get through that, um, and then keep the other pieces short. Cool, so the metadata graph that Data Hub represents obviously ends up looking like everything about everything, because unfortunately, and I was talking to Willie earlier yesterday, the problem with metadata is that you cannot simplify it and say, I'll let this project only model this stuff, and I'll let this other project only model this other stuff, because metadata, unfortunately, has a ton of gravity. You start with the data set, and you say, well, a data set is not enough. I need tables and streams and folders, and then I need schemas and columns, and then I need a business glossary, I need tags, then I need dashboards and pipelines and processes and charts, then I need roles and domains, and now we're talking about data products and data contracts, and the ML people come in, and now we talk about features and models. And so it's an ever-expanding graph, and I don't think it is possible to carve it out. And so as you might imagine, Data Hub has started with you know, certain entities and is just continuously expanding. And more and more entities are getting pulled in, a lot of times by the community pulling it in, or in some cases just the product needs pulling it in, or the industry moving on us. For example, metrics. It was a concept that we talked about but now, with the semantic layer taking traction, metrics are the number one thing that people want us to model in Data Hub. And we're like, okay, yeah, we have to model the concept of a metric and we have to put it in here. So this thing uh, is gonna be ever evolving, but that's what it looks like right now. And the interesting thing about that graph is that it's not static, it's changing continuously. So every single edge or every single entity you see there needs to be versioned, it needs to have events associated with it. A new data set gets created, a new schema gets produced. You need to have events coming for those. Now, in terms of uh, a few lessons we learned in trying to do metadata right um, and getting it wrong many times, uh, a few things we learned was, you know, the first part was this uh, ever-expanding nature of metadata. So you really need to have a 360-degree approach to metadata. It's not just the technical, it's not just the operational, it's not just the social, it's all of that combined. Um, the second thing that we also found, and this was kind of, I learned it the hard way, is if you try to collect metadata after the fact, it's always gonna be wrong, it's always gonna be out of context. And so the best place to collect metadata is the, when data is getting generated. So if you've got a de data developer who's checking in a DBT model or is checking in a Kafka topic schema or authoring an Airflow DAG, if there are opportunities for them to declare metadata, have them do it. So the more you can shift left and be in the developer's toolkit in being able to have them define metadata attributes when they're declaring stuff, the better. Of course, even better is not having them to declare anything and you being able to infer everything automatically. So obviously, don't make people repeat the obvious, but when you need them to tell you what this data set looks like or who the owners are, try to give them those capabilities all the way at the source. And those are kind of the principles that we've adopted while building Data Hub. And the final thing is uh, metadata cannot be static, and this was actually something that the previous speaker was talking about. It has to be continuously flowing. And so Data Hub is not built to accumulate metadata. It's built to accumulate and propagate metadata. So you can sit in front of it, you can sit behind it and get real, real time notifications for metadata that's changing. So this is, you know, in a nutshell, what the journey of metadata looks like. Um, obviously this is an Airflow crowd, so you'll care more about the Airflow edges. Um, and I'll cover those in a bit more detail. But essentially you've got a bunch of data sources they're either emitting metadata continuously or there are crawlers that are pulling metadata uh, ever so often. But in the end, those events uh, move into the Data Hub platform. The actual control plane kind of sits on top of that. 
but for all intents and purposes, it's a streaming metadata graph. And on top of that, you've got continuous monitoring and continuous refinement going on. So being able to detect that a data set landed and therefore I need to trigger a data quality check or detecting that a data quality score landed and therefore now a downstream DAC can probably run. Those are the kind of use cases that we see getting used in the active uh, data processing use cases. And then in the governance space, it could be a new PII tag was added and therefore I need to lock down a data asset or things like that. Um, now downstream of that control plane is really the data discovery application. That is something that most people are familiar with. If you've ever downloaded the Data Hub Quick Start, that's what you get, it's the app. Um, but then the more interesting and more powerful part is I would say the automation capabilities where if you can actually react to every change that's happening in this metadata graph, you can do very powerful things like trigger another DAG or uh, run uh, or send a Slack notification or file a Jira ticket or you know the, the sky is the limit in terms of what you can do if you had infinite visibility uh, into and real-time visibility into everything that was going on in your data stack. Right? So that's kind of our vision. That's what we're uh, pushing towards. And today, I'll just give you a quick uh, demo of the discovery experience in Data Hub and then walk over to the Airflow and data contract side. So this is what the uh, homepage looks like. This is actually the Acryl Cloud product, so there'll be maybe slight differences compared to stock Data Hub, but it's almost the same uh, in terms of how it looks. Um, you know, you, you go in there, you can search across your entire data stack. Maybe you type in, maybe you're a pet store and you type in pets, you get a, you know, search, search results page with contextual highlighting for what matched, um, some ranking based on usage and other things, the usual stuff. And then on the left, you know, handy way to navigate your data ecosystem using a kind of a neat browsing kind of uh, primitive. So that's roughly what the search experience looks like. Usually people find what they're looking for, then drop into the entity page. This is what a table looks like. This is actually a composite table. It's a, it's a DBT model and a Snowflake table combined together as a single table. We do that kind of auto uh, combining on the fly, but essentially you can essentially see the schema of the data set. There are versions that are stored so you can look back in time. And then there's you know, other properties like documentation and lineage. Uh, lineage is one of the things obviously people care about a lot. We support both table level as well as column level lineage. And you know, all of these APIs are open. So if what we find often is perhaps the uh, automatic extraction is pulling in a certain kind of lineage and you want to supplement it with uh, some specific lineage, all you have to do is just emit uh, another event and you can uh, connect the dots. So I, I think metadata extraction is kind of an interesting topic. So I put a slide just so that you understand how metadata extraction in Data Hub works. It's kind of a combination of uh, crawl based as well as push based. Um, the Data Hub interface is push based, which means it's got a schema API, you can push to it um, with an event that says, here was a metadata change that I observed. Um, but you could push to it either from one of the many uh, integration sources. So we've got a crawl based um, framework that you know people have written a lot of uh, contributions to. And for a system like Snowflake, for example, uh, the source connects up to the you know, Snowflake, gets the schemas, uh, parses audit logs, extracts lineage, profiles data, and all of those events make their way to Data Hub. So that's how a typical life cycle of crawling works. And then on the other side, there are emitters like Spark, uh, Airflow, as well as others, where you just drop in those agents in those running systems, and those emitters can push metadata into Data Hub as well. So depending on whether you're a you want to query data at rest or query metadata at rest versus whether you want to emit metadata whenever it's changing, you can kind of pick and choose the, um, the appropriate integration approach. A lot of folks also integrate this up with CI CD systems. So for example, if I'm pushing a Kafka topic to production, I'll emit an event over uh, to Data Hub as well to let it know that a topic exists. So that gives you kind of that real time capability of notifying that a, that a certain um, entity exists. So that's roughly how metadata extraction works, kind of a combination of pull and push. Um, so that was just Data Hub and kind of in general how it works, and we'll now dive into uh, what the Airflow integration looks like. Um, before we go there, you know, the first step in integrating any system with any other system is usually mapping concepts over, right? So in Airflow, there's a concept of a DAG, there's a concept of a task, there are task runs, owners, tags, data sets, and properties. And those are loosely the concepts that we've mapped over to Data Hub. In Data Hub, we call DAGs data flows and tasks data jobs and task runs, data process instances. You know, 
people always get naming wrong. So it's not like we are extremely confident that we got the naming choices right in Data Hub's metadata model. But once you have a model, you have to be backwards compatible with future evolutions. So that's what it is. And so we have task runs that should probably be called data job instances or data job runs, but uh, they're mapped as data process instances. So obviously, there's a bit of model regret that I personally feel. But you know, in the end, um, you end up mapping these concepts and then moving along. So that's what we did with Airflow to Data Hub. And um, in terms of how you can integrate, and this is something that you can do right now, is you know you can use the Data Hub plugin. So Data Hub offers an Airflow plugin that you can just add into your open source Airflow instance. You just need the ability to install plugins, and um, it just looks like a pip install. Uh, and the plugin is enabled. You then have to just add a connection to your Data Hub instance or your Acryl instance. They all look the same. There's an endpoint, and then there's a token. And once you do that, essentially you get out of the box uh, operator support. Like if you're using a SQL operator, it'll SQL parse for you. We actually did a little bit of a benchmark internally with a lot of the other open source projects. Um, and we found that our SQL parser seems to be doing uh, way better. Of course, it was on our data, so you know, caveats there. I'm not a fan of benchmarks in general. Um, but it seems like we're doing much better at SQL parsing compared to other open source projects. Um, the other nice thing about it is it has native support for Data Hub concepts. So, you know, when you're constructing an inlet or an outlet and you want to tell Data Hub about it, you can basically talk to it in Data Hub language of here's a data set and it's in this fabric and so on and so forth. And the plugin just natively knows those concepts. So it makes it a little bit easier to map um, those concepts straight into Data Hub. So what the Data Hub Airflow plugin does is it limit essentially Data Hub metadata events, which is the Data Hub metadata format. Um, now someone asked about Open Lineage, so that's actually coming soon. Um, in the future, um, you'll be able to use the Open Lineage plugin as well. Uh, so if, you know if you're on Open Lineage uh, version whatever that supports a certain version of Airflow, and let's say you cannot customize your plugins and you don't need the Data Hub Airflow plugin for some reason, you like the Open Lineage plugin better, it has a better name or it has some better feature, whatever it is, you should be able to use it. And what will happen is the Open Lineage plugin is going to emit Open Lineage events. And uh, Data Hub is going to essentially support an Open Lineage endpoint. As you can imagine, there will be a mapping exercise of going from the Open Lineage concepts into the Data Hub concepts. And as you know, mappings are lossy. and so. You might not see exactly what you would want, but uh, at least if you've got no way to customize your Airflow instance and you are required to use Open Lineage, then it should work. So that's kind of going to be option two very soon. Um, and additionally, you'll always have the uh, configuration capability to add other additional operators. Like neither Open Lineage nor the Data Hub Airflow plugin can understand opaque code. So if you've got a bash operator and you're doing God knows what in it, um, you know, you end up needing to use inlets and outlets. Uh, in the case of the Data Hub plugin, you'll use inlets and outlets in the Data Hub format, so you'll actually get kind of that nice data set, and then, you know, you can map it directly to Data Hub urns. Uh, if you're using Open Lineage, you'll probably just use the Open Lineage format, and then we'll have to map it on the other side. So you can pick your poison, but, you know, in the end, you'll have to provide that information as part of the DAG authoring capabilities. So once you do all of this hard work, what happens? Uh, first of all, uh, all of your pipelines start showing up in Data Hub. So all of this, by the way, I mean, the Open Lineage integration is coming soon, but the Data Hub Airflow plugin is available today. Um, so all of this is, you know, you can, you can try it out today. You'll get to see all of your pipelines. Um, your pipelines will have tasks, and then uh, your tasks will have runs. Runs will have inlets and outlets, or lineage. You have column level lineage, and um, there's also like a, time-based filtering, so you can look at lineage over time as well. So that's kind of a quick overview of Airflow integration with Data Hub uh, today. No data contracts yet. So it's just Airflow, Data Hub, um, looking like being able to get pipelines and tasks and lineage in. So now let's talk data contracts. Um, so a lot of people, some people raise their hands with data contracts. Uh, when I started working on this, I had heard a lot about data contracts, um, and we were kind of trying to wrap our heads around how it's different from everything else we had worked on so far. And so, of course, we didn't ask Google, we asked ChatGPT. ChatGPT gave back a very reliable and reasonable looking answer. Um, you know, agreement between producers and consumers, defined semantics, a lot of good stuff. 
But it missed one thing important, um, and that's something we would like to add to the definition, which is that a data contract has to be verifiable. It should be something that you can actually programmatically assert is true. Otherwise, what's the point? So we looked at you know, all of the metadata that we were collecting about data sets or pipelines or anything and said, what are the verifiable things? What are the things that we can actually automatically check? And those tended up to be more of the operational and data quality uh, signals, right? So the schema, column level nullability, checks, operational SLAs, things like that. But other things that are important, but are probably not verifiable, uh, like documentation, ownership, tags, they're not part of what we consider a data contract. They could be part of a data product spec, but they're not part of a data contract. So that's kind of our opinion on this. And so what we ended up doing was defining a concept of data contracts and having them uh, align with uh, data sets as well as uh, other entities, but basically align with the concept of assertions. So assertions was something Data Hub already supports, data quality assertions. You can push them from DBT or grid expectations or any system that you have uh, that's a data quality system. And data contract is just bundling up assertions and saying, hey, these are the important ones. These are the important assertions that govern uh, this interchange from a producer to a consumer. Um, so the, yeah, Data Hub already supports assertions. You can emit them um, already. And now we're, and this is what an assertion looks like in the UI. So this was even prior to the data contract work. Uh, you can see how assertions have been doing over time. But then we added the concept of a data contract. And a data contract, is really a YAML specification for combining assertions together in one spec. So you can combine uh, a schema specification and a freshness specification as well as a data quality specification, and you can version control this thing, and you can check it in, and you can uh, ship it to Data Hub anytime you want. So what does the life cycle look like? You might have a data producer that writes one of these, checks it in alongside their DBT model or their Airflow DAG or whatever you have, and then on check-in, the data contract gets registered to Data Hub. That's basically your data contract registry at that point. And then on the back of that registration, a data contract operator can spin up and can start actually evaluating the contract and monitoring that the contract is being validated. And separately, there could be assertion evaluators that are continuously producing results for these assertions that have been registered. So you get essentially a data quality 360 view into the data asset and then interesting downstream actions can happen as a result. So here's a you know, fictitious but all too real example. Two teams and two DAGs. Seems kind of simple. One team, the payments team, it's responsible for computing overdue invoices. They just compute that every day and they produce a table. It's in Snowflake. And then on the other side of that table sits a notifications team who just takes all these overdue invoices that have been produced and sends you know, nice looking emails to customers saying, hey, would you like to pay today? And so this you know, is a pretty reasonable setup. Most teams have dealt with something like this. And, uh, but unfortunately, a lot of things can go wrong here. Um, for example, uh, the overdue invoices table might have a ton of data quality issues and you would like to make sure that certain things are true, like you know, we don't have excessive amounts being billed or we don't have more than one customer email registered or you know, all sorts of things. And so let's say the two teams combine and wrote up a data contract. Once they do that, that contract would get registered to Data Hub. The Data Hub plugin that would already be uh, present in the Airflow instance because it's emitting lineage would essentially report that lineage as well as the run event to Data Hub that allows Data Hub to then trigger the contract evaluator, telling that, hey, there's a new version of the table that has been produced or a new update to the table has happened please reevaluate the contract. And those results can be reported back to Data Hub. And then downstream of that uh, can be a circuit check or a short circuit operator, as they're being called these days, that essentially checks the contract. So the circuit checker isn't hard-coded to only checking two things or one thing. It just says, I just want to make sure my data set is high quality and reliable. The definition of what high quality and reliable means is encoded by the contract. So that makes this interesting. The contract can evolve, the agreements can evolve, but your DAGs don't need to. And then once all of that goes through and the quality check is actually met, you can go ahead and send the email. Um, and that's when I switch to my demo. So I'm gonna essentially move over to an Airflow DAG setup with exactly this, uh, with exactly this setup. So you've got you know, this is the producer DAG. It's uh, called invoice processing. 
and you know it's got you know basic SQL statement. It's doing from group by, and we're gonna run it live. Oh boy, Mr. Scheduler is not happy. So let's run that here. You, you could increase the uh, threshold for checking the healthiness of scheduler. As you can tell, I'm not an airflow expert. Ah, Wi-Fi. What is the Wi-Fi here? Is it conference? Okay. Yeah, the internet is kind of important. Okay, let's see. Is this gonna work? Are we gonna go to the grid? Is that what the experts do? And then let's go over to our overview invoices table. As you can see, it's got a nice little data contract here. Um, and boom, the data set is not meeting its contract. Clearly something bad happened. Um, and if we refresh, We'll find that some assertions are failing. Let's see which assertion failed. Total overdue amount should not exceed certain values. So clearly something wrong was going on with this invoice processing. Let's try to run the emailer and actually verify that the emailer actually won't run if we try to trigger it. And while that is going, I'm gonna go ahead and fix the SQL. So what happened was, you know, this guy, whoever wrote this producer code, ended up uh, not doing a join with um, the customer ID table. And as a result, um, certain test users were added in. So I'm gonna just uh, replace the SQL. All right, I replaced the SQL. Confirmation that the emailer didn't run because of the circuit breaker. Now let's go back to our trusty DAG, producer DAG. They fixed up the SQL, and so we're gonna run it again. And while that's going, we're gonna furiously hit refresh just to see. All right, looks like the assertion passed and we can kind of see all the previous runs, some of them had failed. Now we're gonna go ahead and run the emailer. And hopefully this goes through as well. There we go. And if you look at the code for this emailer, you'll see that the circuit breaker was just added um, as part of the DAG. Uh, it's called a data hub data contract circuit breaker. You just give it um, the data set that you want to monitor, and that's all you need. And that's kind of the demo. It basically shows you how you can actually use data contracts and get them working end-to-end -end in, a, in a pretty real-time fashion and uh, pull off a live demo. So that was uh, pretty much it. And, uh, you know, Acryl Observe allows for creation of these data contracts, so it actually observes how data is changing and proposes contracts. So that ends up kind of making these data contracts much easier to author, so you don't have a ton of work. Um, that was the talk, and uh, you know we'll wrap up with essentially just a summary of what we learned today. I guess we learned what is Data Hub and what it does. We've also learned about how Airflow integrates with Data Hub today and in the future. And finally, uh, a quick intro to how you can implement data contracts and actually integrate it with your Airflow stack. All the resources that I used, including the DAGs, as well as the, you know, the plugins and all of that will be available publicly soon, so follow us along. Um, that's our Slack QR code, so if you join that, you will always be in the know because we publish uh, all of our updates over there. Thank you so much, and uh, I guess I'm out of time, but...